the new version of. Uh, oh, they do on this one now. Yeah. Okay. But I couldn't. Go back. Because we added that slide. Yeah. Okay. I was about to. Well, maybe they did it on this computer special because it's people are making presentations and they come and. This one on this screen. See how it's to the right, but I don't know. I think up there it's. Okay. Yeah, it looks right. It, oh, and it, it never cut anything off. It's just a it, you switched the order. I did. Because I thought you might be going first. Oh, okay. We're going to start tricking people and do like a traffic signal talk, but just title it a Cycle, label it bike. Yeah. Yeah. Not yet. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And um, we, um, because we have a lot to present and we have a large packed house, I think we're going to um, not do individual introductions today. But um, the sign-in sheet for the students who are registered as a course is going to be going around, I think. Um, so just make sure if it comes to you, pass it on to the next person, and it needs to get back to Professor Glebe um, back there in the end. So please make sure it circulates. The final um, papers. Oh, and those of you who are students enrolled in the class, you have um, an assignment due by Tuesday. Um, if you're enrolled in USP, it's due to me. Um, if you're enrolled in the CEE version, it's due uh, to Professor Monsier by 5 o'clock Friday. And I, I accept it electronically. Same here. You can email it. 5 o'clock Tuesday. 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 Sorry, did I accidentally say Friday? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 5 o'clock Tuesday. <laughs> so squeeze on in. On, and um, Okay. So anyway, welcome everyone to the last uh, Friday Transportation Seminar of the fall term. My name is Jennifer Dill. I'm faculty in Urban Studies and Planning. And um, normally I just introduce here, but today I'm also speaking um, along with my colleague, Professor Christopher Monsier in Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, we're presenting the, um, some very preliminary results from our evaluation of the installation of the bike boxes in the city of Portland. Um, this is information that's hot off the press. Um, I won't tell you um, <laughs> how long ago I was actually crunching some of these numbers. So this is, you, you are the first to see these um, as, besides us. So um, welcome everyone. And we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, Where should I? You can, um, uh, I'll go over here. A little logistics here. Um, so this is just an outline of what we're going to be talking about. Some very quick um, background about bike boxes and the installation in Portland. Um, we're really going to focus on the methods and the results of the evaluation. We have a lot to present, so that's going to be the bulk and some preliminary um, conclusions. So uh, my notes, my <laughs> notes didn't print. So I'm doing it all from memory. <laughs> Okay, um, so why, why are there bike boxes? Um, uh, there were a couple um, fatal crashes in Portland where two cyclists were killed um, within um, a very short time period. Um, they were killed by right turning. They were in a bike lane at an inter approaching an intersection. A vehicle turned right. Um, there was a severe conflict that resulted um, in fatalities. One of the responses on the part of the city of Portland um, to this safety problem was to install um, bike boxes. And on the, the right-hand side is sort of a very simple diagram of the concept behind the bike box. Um, and the idea is when there's a bike lane um, on a street approaching a signalized intersection, um, bikes will be cycling up here. If the light is red, then the cyclist can wait in this area 
the box area. When a light turns green, they, they're more visible, they're in front of the vehicle. Um, hopefully it's, going, it's intended to reduce conflicts and then the cyclist um, can continue um, on into this, um, the bike lane across the intersection. And so this is just a typical drawing of, the, of what the bike box looks like with some more uh, dimensions. So on the pavement, there's a weight here stencil um, for the motorist. The bike box, there are, these are the colored ones. There were three boxes that were put up without the color, and you'll see those in the evaluation. So it, the ones without the color look essentially the same without, without the green thermoplastic uh, colored marking. There's a, a sign for motorists uh, to yield to, um, uh, yield to bicyclists. And also, uh, motorists are restricted from making a right turn on red at these intersections. And so these are the typical dimensions of the, of the layout of the bike box. Um, so there were nine bike boxes, nine green bike boxes that were installed and three uncolored bike boxes. So this is an example of the Broadway and Hoyt um, uncolored bike box. That's West Burnside and 14th, the colored bike box. Um, the other two uncolored bike boxes were at Terwilliger, Fer Terwilliger Boulevard and Taylor's Ferry, both northbound and southbound. The green pins are the, are the remaining uh, colored bike boxes. And the pink pins are the four control locations that we also collected data at. So uh, we did sort of two primary uh, analysis methods, uh, video data collection analysis, and we did a survey of motorists and a survey of cyclists. And Jennifer is going to talk about the survey. I'm going to talk about the, uh, the video data collection analysis. So with the help of the city of Portland, we collected pre and post video at these locations, about 48 hours per location. So we have about 936 hours of uh, video data collection. The before video was taken in periods from January to March 2008. The bike boxes were installed, and our after video uh, was taken earlier this year from April to June. Um, the analysis we're going to present today on the video uh, only looks at uh, 10 of the bike boxes where we have pre and post video. There were seven green and seven colored and three uncolored and two control locations. And these are an example of some of the video uh, collections. So the city mounted these uh, video collection devices. And this is actually the, the pre-video. The post-video ended up being digital, so the quality was a little bit better. But depending on where they could mount them at the intersection and place them, they had the video or had the camera up on a pole in a box, and it recorded in time-lapse uh, 48 hours. So uh, as part of the process, we took all that video back. Um, uh, when I say we, I mean our graduate research assistants. Um, <coughs> they, they had the video digitized um, from the city, and we stored them all on our central server. And uh, another thing that we'll be glad when this project is over, because we'll free up gigabytes of data space um, with the video. So for each location, we looked at two peak hours. So we picked the peak hour from the video and from our experience. So we looked at two peak hours, and we included one peak hour. So all of the analysis you'll see here on the video has three hours uh, of, of information in it. Uh, we had three research assistants uh, that coded the video. Uh, Nathan McNeil and Bob Kellett are back there in the back, so they're very familiar with the video. And William Farley also helped, but he's, uh, he's an undergraduate getting ready for finals. Um, we also looked at seven hours of video that we randomly selected. We had all of the video coders analyze them separately and independently, so we'll do some inner rater reliability tests later, but we don't have this in this in analysis. So there was a, a pretty long, uh, detailed set of instructions that we sort of had all the coders following, um, that we sort of made sure that they were looking at the same things. If we di discovered some discrepancies, we went back and reevaluated. So we're pretty confident that the three uh, research assistants uh, were looking at the same types of things and coding the same uh, results. So here from the video today, I'm going to present sort of things in two types. One, just give you an idea of the types of what were the counts, both of the total cars that were going through the intersection, the bicycles, the cars turning right, and the cars stopping. And then some behaviors that we observed from the video related to sort of how well both uh, cyclists and motorists uh, understood and uh, responded to the traffic control, and then also just some preliminary analysis of the conflicts, and we've got some 
a couple videos to show you uh, of, of conflicts that we observed. Fortunately, not very many. So on these next slides, it is just a, I have on the left, there's going to be two figures. On the left uh, is just the counts. The gray uh, bars in the bar plot will be the pre-counts. The black bars will be the post-counts. And on the right uh, figure, I have the difference between those two counts. The gray bars will be the uncolored bike box. The greens are the colored bike box. And the blue bars are the control boxes. So their set of these figures are all the same. And they have each of the 10 intersections we evaluated in the two control locations. So you can focus on either one, but the one on the left gives you a magnitude of the type of the volume, and the right gives you a magnitude of the change from post to pre. So if there was uh, an increase in the post period, the bar shows positive, and if there was a increase or decrease in the pre period or from post to pre, it shows negative, and the y axis shows the difference in the count. So this is just total cars observed, and uh, for the most part, uh, as you the volumes changed in the cars from uh, pre to post, they increased, except for these uh, for Everett, Hawthorne, and Seventh. And we're not quite sure yet exactly why those decreased, but uh, those are the data. It was a relatively small increase, 100 car counts out of uh, 1,000. So, um, in terms of the cyclists, we sort of expected this because of the difference in time of year we, the data was collected. So the pre was in January to March, the post was in uh, April to June. So we expected increase in counts in cyclists, and we definitely saw that. Um, and the Broadway and Hoyt had the most increase from the two periods. Uh, interestingly, our control um, control locations had a had a decrease here. Um, in terms of total cars turning right, this was another measure that we're going to look at the, between the bikes and cars conflicts. We also had a, an increase in the cars uh, turning right from the, from the pre to the post period. Um, except this Burnside one, you can forget that because the video data collection we had, uh, we couldn't actually see the cars turning right in the, first, uh, in the pre period because of the mounting location of the camera. So the pre had no count, so that's why there was that large increase in counts after. Um, and then another measure we were looking at uh, for total cars stopped. Um, again, uh, most, mostly an increase. And this is, and the asterisk is that um, the measure here in the video data, we, we recorded a car every time it stopped or it had some interaction with a bike or an infraction crossing the, entering the bike box or entering the crosswalk. So it's not completely just cars stopped, it has some other elements in it, but it's for right at this preliminary stage, it's a good proxy for the car stopping. All right, so now what you, now what you want to see, the change in the pre-post behaviors. Again, I have the same on the left figure. I've got count change from post to pre. These are the three-hour counts. And on the right figure, we try to do some normalizing. So be recognizing that we, the time periods were different. We had increase in car counts, increase in bike counts. We tried to show... Uh, a difference in the post count normalized uh, minus the pre count normalized. So it give you an idea uh, uh, for uh, some level of controlling for the increase in those two things. What what did the change look like? And again, it's the same color legend. So uh, the first one we looked at um, was the cyclist stopping in the crosswalk. So we measured uh, did the cyclist stop and encroach into the pedestrian zone. The counts, again, are on the left. And it wasn't, it's not a very frequent occurrence. You can see that this is 5 and 10. And the normalized count of the number of cyclists arriving on red uh, was a, generally a fairly positive trend that the cyclists uh, and the post condition didn't enter the crosswalk. And this is a, uh, a, a beneficial, uh, a positive finding. So we looked at the motor vehicle encroachment in the crosswalk. So in the precondition, we sort of well, we have these three types of conflicts. One, the vehicle is just sort of in the crosswalk, up to 25%. One, up to 50% of the vehicle is in the crosswalk. And the second, uh, it's, it's significantly in the crosswalk. And so we'll call those minor, moderate, and major. And those are uh, so. Um, and definitely a positive finding here, even on all three of these encroachment types, um, from the minor encroachment. Uh, a, very strong positive effect, and you would expect that with the bike box and most cars stopping prior to the bike box that they wouldn't be able to enter the crosswalk. Um, 
Same with the moderate in increase, very significant positive finding of cars not entering the crosswalk. And the same, uh, although uh, we need to explore this uh, Broadway and Taylor a little bit more in detail, um, but the major encroachment in the crosswalk was positive except for that one location. And you'll see that location comes up uh, quite a few times, so we, we're going to go back and do some a little bit more analysis of that location. Um, so then uh, this is just post conditions. This one's a little bit different. This is motor vehicle encroachment in the bike box. There are four sets of slides. The top left one is no encroachment. So this is where the bike, this is where the motorist did what they were supposed to do, didn't enter the bike box upon stopping. And you can see that, that it's, it's pretty high. There's not much difference between the colored and the uncolored, which was not, we were sort of expecting to find a difference between the colored and the uncolored bike box. Uh, but about 80% or more of motorists uh, complied with the, with the traffic control at the bike box. And then we sort of separated it out again by that minor, moderate, and major. But the y-axis change here, it, it's not 100%. It only is 20%, just to give you an idea. And again, there's not, the thing to take is there's not really any apparent difference between the color differences between the colored box and the uncolored box. We're going to do some analysis of, obviously, of pooling these intersections together to see what we get. Taylor's Ferry, or Terwilliger and Taylor's Ferry isn't a very high volume location. Um, so then we looked at another, uh, the motor vehicle encroachment in the bike lane. And we had three types of encroachments in the bike lane. One is this prior to the intersection. So uh, the motorist moves over prior to the intersection, sort of using that bike lane as an additional uh, additional lane to make the turn. The second is sort of this minor uh, clip here of the bike lane as they're making the turn. And the second uh, was while they were paused waiting to, or the third was paused while they were making a right turn. In the post condition, we made a virtual bike lane to compare this to. So we, um, and this might be a thing we can discuss at the end here. So we marked on the screens the bike lane going up here. We wanted to see the vehicle follow the same trajectory sort of staying out of this uh, bike lane, even though the white line, the solid white line, doesn't come all the way up. So we just wanted to see the difference in that behavior. And, we'll, and you'll see that um, there was a, a fairly positive in terms of that encroachment prior to the intersection. So most before, uh, most conditions afterwards, there was a significant change in the behavior, which was good. Um, but this is where that clipping of that turn with the bike box uh, there was a significant increase of people sort of entering that, even though that lane wasn't there, taking that turn a little bit flatter. We're not quite sure what that means or if that's a significant finding, but, um, but we analyzed it. So we're going to dig into it a little bit more. Um, but this is, of all the behaviors we analyzed, this is the only one that's potentially uh, negative. And for the encroachment while stopped, uh, again, uh, a significant uh, decrease. And these were all normalized by stopping vehicle. We also looked at, well, how did the cyclist use the bike box? And we still need to do some filtering for this um, uh, for when there was bikes in either location B or C. So right now, this is just all cyclists that stopped in the bike box. Where did they stop? This is position. Position A is using the box. Position B is uh, in the box, but sort of in that virtual bike lane. And then C is. Uh, before the bike lane, and then D is other, which would be uh, in the motor vehicle lane or some other location. So uh, not surprisingly that most bikes stayed in the bike lane. Uh, there was some use of the bike box. The next step we'll do is take out. We'll look at, well, where did the cyclist stop when somebody was in B? Did they choose to go into A or stay behind them in C? But we haven't filtered that, filtered that down yet. Um, so then we looked at, we did some conflict analysis. And the way we set this up is that um, during the graduate research assistance reviews of the video, anything they thought was a conflict, they flagged. Um, and we had a fairly long list of 50 or 60 potential conflicts. And we had a sort of a, a panel review of them, uh, Jennifer, I, and uh, two of the graduate students. We go through the, each of the conflicts, independently rate them and then kind of discuss them and come to a final conclusion about whether it was a conflict or not. So some things that were flagged, we were very generous in flagging the video whether it was a conflict. But then in our sort of post review, some things we said, no, that wasn't a conflict. Yes, that was a conflict. Um, of these 10 
of these 10 bike box locations, there were 20 conflicts in the precondition and 14 in the postcondition. We rated the conflicts in, the, in three categories, major being almost very, very close to being a collision, substantial, and most of the conflicts, most of those 34 conflicts were in the minor situation. Um, sometimes we were hedging whether we would, was that a conflict, was it not a conflict? So some of these are, I think some of these are pretty minor. But we also categorized uh, uh, the, the cyclist and vehicle's uh, reaction in terms of precautionary braking, emergency braking, whether they came to a full stop. So we coded all of this information about the conflict analysis. So now we want to show two videos. So this is one of the pre-conditioned videos. You'll it's in the in the stop laps makes it a little hard to see it, but you'll see right here, and it's a little hard. We could probably play it again. There was a cyclist. The white pickup truck obviously didn't see that cyclist and kind of cut it. So here the cyclist comes right after this guy. So he's right there. Yeah. So. Was that um, Crash track. <laughs> <laughs> we won't. <laughs> and then we have uh, a post condition at this is at uh, 16th and Everett. Um, so, so this was one of our major conflicts. So, um, so this is a plot here of the post, the pre number of conflicts is on the x-axis, on the y-axis is the post conflicts. So just picking one of these points, uh, in the precondition at Southeast 11 and Hawthorne, there were, th there were three in the precondition and there was only two conflicts observed in the post condition. So anything, and this is the equal line, so anything plotted over here, there were more conflicts in the after condition. Anything plotted below the line, there were fewer conflicts in the after condition. One thing to note is these are very small numbers that we're looking at here. So the most, the most conflicts was at uh, Broadway and Taylor in the pre-condition. There were 12 conflicts, but only two in the post-condition. So these are, but all of these down here were in the one, two, three, four range. So pretty small number of conflicts, but um, so that's, uh, and Burnside had no conflicts in the precondition and, and one in the postcondition. Um, and also, so Broadway and Sixth had no conflicts in either pre or post, and the two Twilliger, Fer Twilliger and Taylor's Ferry had no conflicts in the pre or post. So they're not on the, so there's only seven dots on this plot. So this, uh, so this plot is replicated in the upper left here, but I've changed, I've left off the text so you can just see the numbers. Then we also, so those were just raw counts, raw conflict counts, so we're exploring some potential um, normalizing factors. So this is conflicts per cycle volume, um, and things don't change too much. This is conflicts between, conflicts per total cars turning right, and then an interaction term conflict between cars and right times the cyclist volume. So uh, we're still digesting this. I'm, on what it means, um, on whether there was a decrease in the conflicts from the pre to the post condition. Um, with the small number here, though, it's going to be pretty tough to make any kind of good conclusion. So we're still exploring that. But it looks, uh, one thing we can say is it doesn't appear to be any kind of negative impact. So it's either neutral or positive. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. To, uh, tell people about using the microphone. We'll, we'll take, yeah. Do you have a clarification question? I can hold the question. Okay. All right. Um, and then here I just wanted to, we're ex just taking a look at some of these, taking, excluding this, the outlier here of the 12 conflicts at Broadway and Taylor. This is the conflicts, again, relatively small numbers per observed bicycles. So we, maybe if we're wishful, we could get a trend here where we see as more cyclists, more, less conflicts. But then you would expect sort of the, as more cars are turning right, um, more you'd expect a positive trend here. So we'll do some more exploring about putting these two together. Uh, 
doing some analysis of that. But this is the idea of uh, what we see, expect to see as more cyclists, less conflicts, um, and maybe some clues about cars, the volume of cars turning right, is there a, appropriate locations. Um, so that concludes the video portion. So turn it over. So I'm gonna, you just um, stay there. I'll stay here. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the um, surveys that we um, <coughs> conducted um, to understand the perceptions and understanding um, of the bicycle boxes. We conducted some intercept surveys of bicyclists. And what we did, and again, when I say we, I mean our graduate student <laughs> researchers um, primarily, um, stood out at five of the intersections. Um, and there's a picture there. You can see the sign. Handed a postcard to the bicyclist who stopped or would stop to, to take the card. I'm curious, anyone here get one of those cards and do the survey? Yeah, I keep running into people all the time um, who got them. Um, and so on the postcard, there was a website address for them to go and fill out the survey online. We handed out 997 of those postcards, and almost half of those postcards, the person did respond. And I should note that on the postcard, there was a unique number on there that they had to enter into the survey. Um, so that was to um, not allow people to go in and fill out multiple surveys or um, random people from who knows where. So we wanted to make sure that you know, each cyclist going through could fill out the survey just once. So. We also um, wanted to survey motorists to find out and assess whether or not they understand the bike boxes and how they feel they're affecting um, the driving and the cycling um, environment and safety. What we did here, um, we looked into the possibility of whether or not we could um, record license plates and, and of motorists driving through intersections and get the information and mail them. Um, that's not possible. Um, that information is confidential, and so we, we could not um, work with DMV to get that. So we're trying to figure out, well, how else can we reach motorists who probably drive around these intersections? Um, what we were able to do, teaming up with the city of Portland, the city of Portland, um, during the construction of the um, downtown, um, the reconstruction of the transit mall, um, did a Smart Trips program where they did a huge amount of outreach to people working downtown um, about different options um, of getting downtown and all the problems with the traffic and diversion. And so they had quite a large mailing list of people who had at least inquired about that program and had filled out an initial survey talking, to, um, giving some information about how they usually got to work downtown. So from that sample, we there were just over 3,000 employees downtown who did drive to work um, downtown at, at some point in time. So the city was nice enough to send out um, a request to those folks to complete the survey. Um, and about 24% of the people um, getting that email did respond to the survey. Um, we did offer incentives on both of these, an incentive drawing that I think um, helped boost response rate. We had, so we had over 700 um, motorist um, <coughs> drivers who worked downtown completing the survey. So I'm just going to highlight some of the, um, I think, some of the key responses on the survey. So one of the things that we needed to test, this is a, a sort of a very new marking, a pavement marking. Um, and it's very important that when you put new markings on the road that motorists understand what they mean and respond as uh, we w intend them to. Um, so we did just a simple question, showed them these pictures and say, you know, if you approach an intersection with a red light, where should you stop your car? Um, pretty straightforward. So 94% of the motorists did um, answer correctly that they were supposed to stop. The little weight here is a bit of a clue that you're supposed to, but we had, you know, we couldn't take that away because the weight here is on the pavement. So only 2% said, you know, stop in that box, and um, a few people didn't know. Uh, we also gave them a scenario where there was actually a bicyclist in this area. Um, and then which option, where should you um, stop? Slightly different, but still the vast majority of the motorists did say you're supposed to stop um, um, on the right hand <laughs> one. Um, we also had a couple other questions where we had photos of a, from the video, a photo of the um, car and a bike and said, you know, is that the right, is that correct? And uh, very consistent, more than 90% of the motorists 
you know, got it correct that the motorist was not supposed, to, or the car was not supposed to be um, in the bike box area. So there seems to be an understanding um, of how these are supposed to work. Um, we also were trying to get at that because the city was testing both the green pavement and the um, non-colored pavement. Um, so we're trying to get at which of these might work better. So we asked as a driver, do you think one of the pavement marking designs is better than the other? And these um, were the pictures we used. And pretty overwhelming, 89% of the motorists felt that that green was a better um, design and a better marking. So we also asked a lot of questions about perception of safety because in the research that we had looked at, there's, there's not a whole lot of research out there about bike boxes is one thing that I um, should have probably explained in the beginning. Um, because first of all, in the U.S. there are not very many bike boxes. There are some, um, they are growing in number in the U.S. and there's many installed in some other countries. There's been very limited research, but in general a lot of the research has shown, similar to what we're seeing, is that there's really not a whole lot of conflict. So it's hard to see changes in conflict, but there are often changes, significant changes in people's perception of safety. Um, and if we're talking about trying to increase the number of people cycling, which is an objective of the city, then people's perception of safety is going to influence whether or not they decide to bicycle. So it is important to look at um, people's perception of safety. So um, of all the motorists, um, over half of all the motorists th thought that um, the bike box made that intersection either a little or a lot safer. Now what I did decide to do is screen out because a lot of people are both motorists and bicyclists and some people responding to this survey might be very active bicyclists using the bike boxes, might have a very different perception of them than someone who only drives in the area. So I filtered out um, any of the uh, respondents who also rode a bike through bike boxes and you can see those on the um, right um, and fairly consistent results. Still 45% of those motorists felt that the bike box made the intersection either a little or a lot safer and only if you look down below 13% thought that it made the intersection a little um, or a lot more dangerous um, and a lot significant 22% you know, didn't know. I'm sure they're waiting for the results of our study to um, <laughs> make an opinion. Uh, so some other key findings from the motorist survey. So of the motorists, I'm going to focus on the motorists who have not biked through a bike box. Um, so are only viewing it through the lens of a driver. 40% uh, think that drivers drive more safely because of the bike boxes. 43% think that the bike boxes make driving less convenient, either a little or a lot, at those intersections. On the other hand, 37% said that they felt more comfortable driving through the intersections um, because of the bike boxes, and only 16% said it was less comfortable. So it may be a little less convenient, but they feel more comfortable, uh, perhaps because they're more aware of, of who is supposed to be where in terms of using the road space. Um, and 55% think that the bike boxes make drivers more aware of bicyclists generally. We're trying to get at that idea that maybe by installing the bike boxes, drivers become just more aware and thinking about bicyclists in general. So therefore, when they're driving elsewhere, they might be thinking or making other right turns at other intersections. So. And 37% of those motorists um, think that the city should install more bike boxes. 13% thought that they should remove some or all of the bike boxes and then everyone else um, was just in between. Um, neutral, no opinion. The cyclist survey, um, as we might expect, uh, but we you know, now have the data to show it, um, over 75% of the bicyclists responding to the survey thought that the, bi that the bike box at the intersection where we surveyed them uh, made it either a lot or a little safer going through that intersection. So a pretty large increase um, in the perception of safety at that intersection. Um, only 2% thought it made it a little more dangerous and a lot of people either didn't know or didn't think it made a difference. So a pretty big increase in perception. Um, also from the bicyclist survey, 
Um, Thirty-seven percent of uh, the cyclists thought that most motorists understood the purpose of the box, and about an equal number thought that they didn't understand the purpose. Though we also asked, you know, when you come to a red light, how often is a motorist either in the bike box or encroaching a little, encroaching into it? Um, and the majority of the respondents says that, that never or rarely did they encounter a motor, a, a car in the um, bike box itself. Um, and 81% think that motorists are more aware of cyclists because um, of the boxes. And again, these are perceptions. Obviously, bicyclists don't know for sure what motorists are thinking and vice versa. And, um, but again, I want to emphasize that um, people's perceptions influence their behavioral decisions, so it is important that we consider them. And 83% um, thought that the bike boxes make for a better environment for bicycling. And 72% think that the city should install more of them. Um, and they gave us many suggestions of particular intersections, and we'll be sharing that um, with the city. They also had other suggestions for changes to make to the boxes, et cetera, and we're going to be digging through all that data and um, sharing it with the city. So we've given you um, a pretty good snapshot of um, some of the data that we've gone through so far and have some preliminary um, conclusions. Um, that we see so far, we feel pretty confident that definitely most motorists understand and obey the boxes. I mean, 80% of them were stopping uh, before the box on a red light. Vast majority of the motorists on the survey gave the correct answer in terms of what they were supposed to do. Cyclists aren't observing many motorists going into the box when they're not supposed to be there. So they seem to be understood and people seem to be behaving for the most part um, the way they're intended to. Um, pedestrians may be benefiting from reduced encroachment into the crosswalk area. Um, so fewer cars and fewer bicyclists seem to be going into that area because of the bike boxes. So there's a, um, another benefit. There seem to be fewer cars entering the bike lane prior to the intersection, but there may be more of them cutting the corner a bit close into you know, what we've called that virtual bike lane. And again, we're not exactly sure if if that's a problem, it's something that we um, want to explore a bit more and any ideas you have, but it's something that we did look at and we we're wondering how it would affect things. So. There just are very few conflicts, either before or after, which makes this type of research difficult. And if you look at, um, I mean, we've reviewed not just uh, research on other bike boxes, but research on different types of striping, other types of pavement markings you know, the, the blue bike lanes, all sorts of those types of things that do this type of pre and post evaluation using video or observation. And just conflicts just don't happen all that often. Um, and so it's um, fairly common not to be able to detect a statistically significant difference um, given how much of the video we sampled. Um, so that is one constraint. There is a limit. You know, if we had, I guess, a, a much bigger budget, we could pay more grad students to view more video and, and get a bigger sample of conflicts. But um, right now, there's just very few before or after. But I think we feel pretty confident um, that there isn't a significant increase in conflicts. Um, and so the, um, the result may either be a neutral um, or a positive uh, influence or relationship. <coughs> Uh, and definitely from the survey, I think um, there's definitely perceptions that safety has increased both on the part of motorists and bicyclists. The percentage of cyclists um, definitely see a bigger um, improvement in safety, but the motorists as, as well um, thought that the, for the most part, um, the majority or more of them thought that it was safer rather than being less safe um, afterwards. And um, we are, uh, like we've emphasized a few times, this is, you know, hot off the press, we're still digging through the numbers and there's a lot more to look at, but I think what we're seeing so far has been pretty interesting. We want to show one more video um, that I think gives a good example of how you want, so you see the truck and there's the bicycles back here and they're both waiting for each other <laughs> um, to go through the intersection and it's sort of a um, classic, I think, uh, Portland, Portland moment. moment. <laughs> <laughs> Both are being so polite that no one goes. So, 
Um, and we saw, when we were looking through things that had been flagged as conflict, several of them, once we looked at it, it really turned out to be, well, that's exactly what is supposed to happen. Um, you know, the, the bicyclist and the motorist were both coming to an intersection. The bike box was there, and they both, you could interpret from the video that the driver saw the bicyclist and vice versa, and we were trying to sort of, well, what's supposed to happen? And, you know, they negotiated and the cyclist went through. Um, so at least that's uh, how we interpret the movement. Obviously, we're not um, in their heads knowing exactly what they were thinking. but. Um, so those, whoops, sorry, keep going back and forth. So we are, we're going to be digging through the data. We need to, we'll be writing up um, a report on all of the findings pretty in-depth. We have obviously a lot of data. We're going to be doing that, hopefully be able to release it in winter. We have some people that we want to acknowledge. The city of Portland was a partner on this project, um, providing funding um, and helping with the video collection, information, et cetera. So we want to thank the staff there. We had some great student research assistants, and I particularly want to thank Nathan McNeil, who was the graduate research assistant on the project from the beginning and um, has done a really fine job um, on the project. Bob Kellett and Will Farley also helped in terms of the uh, video data analysis. And then I also have to acknowledge OTREC as the other funding partner um, on the project. And with that, actually we went through those slides. I was really worried about time. Yeah. We have plenty of time for some more questions. And I will remind everyone that we do webcast the seminar, and so there are microphones. And so when you ask a question, please hold the touch button down, keep the red light lit while you're asking the question so that people on the web can hear it. And I don't know if we have the portable mic or yeah, not. Yeah, we do. Great. Should we okay. just give Rob a clarifying? Oh, yeah. Rob, you had a question earlier. We can go back to the slide if you need. Yeah, well, the question I had was um, if I got the the presentation correct, you reviewed three of the 48 hours, correct? Yeah, yeah. right. Um, so there is more data that we could mine there in the existing before and after video, but we're limited basically by our resources to do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but, And we would be going into more off-peak hours yeah. for that additional data where there would be, you would expect fewer conflicts. Right. Uh, yeah, because there And the video spanned... Most of it spanned two days, right, Nathan? Um, so we picked the peak. So we'd have a you'd have a PM peak, and an AM peak, and then another PM peak to. Um, so yeah, there's more data, um, but what it, it took about ten hours per hour. Uh, more like three or four, I definitely. Just felt like that. Going <laughs> <laughs> so it's like about, about yeah, so. For every hour of video, it took about three hours worth of time to code, to it. code it. So, so are you through reviewing the the video to my, to get data out of it? Yeah. Unless we, yeah, I guess get more money. To do that. Uh, right here. Did you guys notice a significant difference between the more urban areas versus the um, sites that were more suburban, like Twilliger? Well, I mean, the big thing is to Williger, there just wasn't, I mean, the volume of bicyclists was pretty low. And so that. You yeah, know, the volume was pretty low, and it, it happened to be both, both the uncolored locations. So, but it's mainly the volume. There's a lot of car volume there, but not a lot of bike volume. But we didn't find any conflicts of the, of the small sample we looked at. Right here, and then Mark, and then we go to the back. I was um, interested if you separated the surveys into male and female and whether you noticed any interesting differences there. Uh, I haven't done that yet. I will say that um, they're the opposite. So the um, cyclist survey, about 65% or so of the respondents were male, about 35% female, which is about the split of cyclists. Um, the motorist survey was almost the exact opposite. It was far more women. Um, and I suspect there are a couple things going on there. I think perhaps women were more likely to want to respond to the survey. That's just speculation. But also, I, and again, I don't have data on this, but I think the pool of um, 
workers who were part of this email list could have been more heavily female as well in a in sort of office environment working downtown, but that's, I'm just speculating. But that is one thing I'm going to look at um, is the differences between gender. Um, I did look at one thing I didn't mention, um, forgot to, but you just reminded me, is on the bicyclist perception of safety. We had asked them like how comfortable they feel riding in heavy traffic. So I did compare the folks who felt comfortable versus, or uncomfortable versus not. Um, and there actually was no difference in terms of how they thought the um, bike boxes affected their perception of safety. So that was one difference I have looked into. Let's see, Mark, you had a question, and then I'm gonna go back, and then over here. You said there's a real dearth of research on this type of activities, and you did both reported behaviors and observed behaviors on studies in the future, since I, will there, I think there will be more. What is your recommendation on what types of methodologies you, you think are the best, or is, is this combined approach optimal? Do you want to? Or well, I mean, I think, <clears throat> I mean, long term, you could take a look at the, you know, if you wait long enough, you can look at the collision data, but even that's pretty sparse. Um, I think the video data is probably the best way to go, but I think advanced technology, so if you know if you could monitor, you could just put the video up and you could let the computer do everything, uh, then we could process a lot of data. And there, are, I've seen software that, that does that. The uh, University of Washington's got, you know, they can track peds and bikes in a video. Uh, and, you know, obviously you can do that with cars. So you could put the pass, collect time to conflicts. Um, so I think in the future that that would allow you to get l much larger data sets at much lower cost. But I have yet to see a study that didn't use student researchers to process the videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think, I mean, the difference is you're, you're getting sort of the objective data of exactly what was happening, at least as we coded it, versus people's perceptions. Um, and I think both of those are pieces of information that are important. Um, <laughs> We want to know exactly, you know, what is the effect on safety, uh, but also I think the effect on people's perceptions is also very important. Again, it, it gets at their decision making. So, um, the driver survey. Um, I thought you could buy the DMV data on the internet. I heard <laughs> something like that. There was a few years ago, but maybe not. Um, but I was thinking about that and I think well smart groups people who responded to the smart trips program maybe are a little bit more aware drivers and, and so I don't know how you could account for that but one question I had is what percentage of the respondents were um, not who said they've never used a, a bike box or ridden through a bike box on a bicycle versus had. I mean, did that give you some indication? Oh, or? yeah. So I think you're right, and that's one thing. I mean, this isn't an ideal random sample. Um, it is people who responded to the city, you know, about this program that they were running downtown. So um, that is a constraint. We, we were somewhat limited in trying to come up with a sample. Um, the, of the 717 total respondents, just over 400 or so of them had never ridden a bike through a bike box. So it, it was still a pretty large number. Um, and we also have data in there about how frequently they bicycle too. So we can, we can try to even get it down further to people who like never ride a bicycle um, and obviously have never ridden a bike through a bike box and see if, if their perceptions are different. Um, so we can slice and dice it that way as well. So we did ask the DMV about sharing, and they wouldn't let us. So maybe there's an illegal source, but <laughs> a, uh, federally funded research project could do that. Um, is there is there a concern that there will be in the same way that crosswalks are sometimes seen as as having as a, what would be called a false sense of security when you paint a crosswalk versus not? Do you, can you imagine how long, how many of these will have to go through before we have that, that amount of data? Is that something we can look forward to and, and, and plan for to say, well, at what point will the green bike boxes give us more of a perception of safety than actually exists? Ah, uh, boy. Yeah, I... You want to tackle uh, that? I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't... I mean, I, I guess, you know, I think 
I didn't watch all of the video, but I don't think we detected sort of any cyclists taking any apparent risks because they felt this pavement marking gave them some sort of priority. Um, so I, I don't. I guess I would think of it a little differently than a crosswalk, but 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 that's a good point, I guess. There's a hand in the back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you make any distinction between day and night uh, because of the propensity for fatal accidents to occur during the dark? Uh, the video only worked during the day, so I mean we couldn't we couldn't be able. I mean you saw some of the quality of the video, and that was daytime. Um, so we didn't collect any nighttime data. So. Yeah, and some of the pre-video did have, because of the time of collection, it was a little bit darker, you know, because of the winter light conditions than, than the post conditions. But we didn't separate that out at all. Uh, you, you surveyed cars on their understanding of where the car belongs in the bike box. Do you have any data on bicyclists and driver understanding of where bikes belong within the bike box, specifically oh. that A area? Do drivers realize that bikes can go in there, and do cyclists realize that they can also go in there? Those are good questions. So we did not specifically ask motorists. Well, I should, we did not have a, a close-ended, a, a, a um, explicit question of where they thought the bicyclist was supposed to be. We have an open and the very, almost the very first question that we asked them. And I guess another thing I should explain is when we invited them to participate in the survey, we didn't say it was about bike boxes. We said it was about intersections and it was sort of broad because we didn't want to bias. Um, and one of the first questions, we showed them a picture of a bike box and we, it's an open ended question. What do you think this is for? What is this supposed to do? Um, we, because the, um, the motorist survey, the deadline to respond to it was about three days ago. So I have not gone through and coded all those open-ended responses yet, but that's, that was the idea. Because we didn't really want to lead them on, so we just have this open-ended, what do you think they're for? So we'll be coding that to sort of see about that. On the bicyclist side, we did ask them when they come to the intersection, where do they normally so we sort of got their actual behavior. And we also asked them very early on the very open-ended question of what do you think the purpose of the bike box is. So we'll be able to, to see if people understand the idea that they were supposed to be in. But we certainly yeah. got yeah. anecdotal, you know, anecdotally we got people saying. Yeah, and in the video yeah. data we also have, um, we coded the location information such that when the cyclist is arriving at the bike box, if there was somebody in ahead of them in the bike lane, we can tell whether they stopped behind the bike or they went into the bike box. Uh, I mean, you could see the total numbers. It wasn't compared to the rest of the locations. Um, and we know the signal indication. We know the times of all these arrivals. So there's lots to dig into about. But I think for the most part, it really takes the higher volume locations for bikes to start moving into the box. Um, on the lower volume locations, we didn't see much use of the, of the box. Though even though they're in the sort of the bike lane, they're still physically in front of the car. So yeah. you still get that benefit of higher visibility, even though they might not be right in front. So um, let's go here and then I'm gonna go over there. I'm curious about how you chose the um, control intersections, because it seems to me that a really good control intersection would have been Northwest 14th and Everett, um, where there's a lot of right turning cars coming, um, turning from Northwest 14th onto Everett, which is one way there. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was slated for a bike box, but didn't get it, but I'm not 100% sure about that. It was one of the 14 original intersections of the city. I can't, I can't picture that location in my mind for some reason, but, um, we have two other locations that were downtown at control locations. I didn't show any of the analysis because we only have um, we only have post data there. So they're at uh, we have one at Seventh and Hawthorne and one at um, First and Madison, yeah. First and Clay. So we have two other ones downtown, um, and those locations those got selected at the beginning of the study. Yeah. The, um particularly the ones where we had the pre and the post data. We sat down with the city ahead of time and you know the the different bike boxes, the intersections have different configurations. Sometimes there's parking, sometimes there's not, sometimes there's a bus stop, there's 
they have different configurations. Sometimes there's two lanes, one, you know. And so what we were looking for was similarly configured intersections that also had high volumes of bicyclists and a bike lane and, and all of those characteristics. And um, you may be right that that one could have been a good one and maybe we just didn't think of it. But that, that was the idea. We're trying to get similar, but the only thing different was the <coughs> bike box. And, and we also, we, we structured the study to be sort of pre-post at the same location and the control was not, we don't want to link that. We weren't going to do sort of a linked, you know, pre-post at both locations. We want the control to give us some idea, you know, if we see, if we see, you know, all this <laughs> good behavior at the bike box location and negative behavior at the control locations, but that's you know a good location or a good idea. But if we saw everything had the positive event, even though we didn't do anything at the control locations, then we would want to dig into, dig into it a little bit more. So that was kind of the purpose of the control was to sort of give us a, a check on whether what we're observing is really the effect of the of the treatment or not. Yeah, because the other thing, we didn't want the controls to be too close to a bike, you know, like the intersection right before, because the people traveling through there are exposed to the bike box and affect, could affect their behavior. And, and the blue shirt. Um, Chris or Neil, um, in the conflict analysis, did you happen to have the ability to separate conflicts by, on the one class, uh, vehicles and bicycles that had to stop at the red? compared to everything else where either the vehicle or the bicycle was con uh, you know proceeding on the green as it approached the uh, the intersection uh, I, I'm not sure I'm understanding that. well yeah. my hunch I is that the that the value of the bike box is greater when the vehicles and the bicycles are both stopped on the red at the intersection and that you're not really addressing the right hook problem with the bike boxes when the the vehicles and or the bicycles are approaching the intersection on the green. And so my hunch is that uh, you might show a better improvement in terms of the conflict analysis relative to those conflicts involving vehicles and bicycles that have stopped on the red compared to all the, all the rest yeah, of the and, conflicts. And we can separate that out, but my, my hunch is, my guess is from my from reviewing is that those were a very minor subset of the of the conflicts. So most of the conflicts were were sort of the, the latter, which you described, which nice. is which is which is good. But we can take a look at those locations where the where the bike was stopped and the car was stopped at the red. And I don't remember any uh, conflicts having occurred when when both. The bike and the car were stopped. Um, yeah, mo like all the, the other minor ones we saw are sort of when the the light turned red and the car sort of moved up into the you know right before a bike arrived at the red. So, well, and the reason I think that's important, if you remember the two fatalities that occurred in Portland, I believe if they the were newspapers the were right, the one uh, on Burnside was yeah. The one that, well, the one on Burnside was definitely they were both stopped I believe on the yeah. red, but the one on Greeley or Interstate. I believe that the truck was stopped, but the bicycle wasn't. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? No, no. They were both moving, or they both they both entered the intersection on green. Yeah. green. Okay. John. Okay, so we have a couple questions from the web, and maybe this will be the last one. Um, I'll ask um, one question that came from two people, which is oh, I'm combining things here, so. How visible are uh, to colorblind individuals are the thermoplastic green box colorations? And a uh, related question is, can we draw any conclusions yet whether or not that coloration is necessary? So that that would depend on we didn't it would depend on the contrast between the black and the between the black, the green, and the white, and I think there's sufficient contrast that they might they don't wouldn't be able to tell it's green, but they would be able to tell there's a difference. They're plenty visible to colorblind people, I can attest. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some personal experience. So oh, good. So can In we draw any the, conclusions? The difference between the two. I mean, do you want to speak to with the video, and then I can talk about the survey. In terms of the difference between colored and not colored, if we can conclude anything yet. Um. Yeah, surprisingly, I guess our data didn't, I expected to see more of a pronounced difference between some of the motorist behavior at the, between the colored and not colored. Uh, at this preliminary cut, didn't see that yet, so, but 
Yeah, but one the of the issues is that two of the uncolored ones, it was the Terwilliger, where there weren't a whole lot of volume of cyclists, at least, and it was a different type of environment, and I don't know if that's affecting things. Certainly the perception of when, you, when we showed the motorists both pictures, they think the green is better. Um, we don't know why. They, you know, it was a, just a straightforward which is better, and they like the green better. And, but again, you don't, we don't know for sure if that's because you know, they see it better or if they just like green. I, you know, but, <laughs> but that yeah. was pretty overwhelming. 89% yeah, said the green was better. And it, the, the colored, non-colored thing sort of got hoisted on the study towards the middle part, so it wasn't initially yeah. something we set out to test. Uh, last question here. Um, with with the before and after, um, the bicycles that move illegally on red, did you notice if that was increased or decreased or neutral with the addition of the bike box? One of our problems is that we don't, given where the video was mounted, we aren't always sure whether the light was red or not in some of the cases. Yeah, so for the, it was a little bit easier to tell for the cyclist because we could see other cars stopped. So we could see clearly when the cyclist violated the red signal. We couldn't see so clearly for the motorist because there were no cars and somebody, we, I mean, we couldn't see. So we did have a slide on the cyclist behavior with the red light, um, but we left it off here um, just because we're not sure about the, it was kind of all over the map, the change in behavior. So what we will take a look at that, whether the, whether the bike box had any impact on cyclists choosing not to, choosing to, to, not to make an illegal move to the intersection. But we did collect the data, and yeah, so yeah. far there wasn't a clear pattern. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and um, we'll be sharing more information um, as we get it, and um, enjoy your holiday vacations. Oh, so there's notes there. Somehow. <laughs>